Well, happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to the final full day of the 2021 NSBP conference. So today um, we are going to have a, we've had a lot of different uh, representation of careers in physics. So today we get to hear a perspective from a representative working in industry in physics. And I have the great honor to introduce Dr. Danelle Walton as our speaker today. Dr. Donnell Walton is the director of the Corning Technology Center in Silicon, Silicon Valley. He leads research and business development efforts to match Corning's existing and emerging capabilities and opportunities in the Western United States, particularly in the Silicon Valley region of California. Walt, Dr. Walton joined Corning in 1999 as a senior research scientist in science and technology. He performed and led research in optical fiber amplifiers and lasers. In 2004, Dr. Walton led Corning's research and development efforts to a world leadership position in high power fiber lasers. In 2006, he managed silicon, gla silicon on glass platform expansion project which demonstrated non-display applications of silicon on glass, including imagers and voltaics. In 2008, Dr. Walton joined Corning Gorilla Glass team as a super senior applications engineer, and he extended the Gorilla Glass value proposition to form factors larger than handheld devices. In 2010, Dr. Walton was appointed manager of worldwide applications engineering for Gorilla Glass. Prior to joining Corning, Walton was a physics professor at Howard University in Washington, DC, and he won the National Science Foundation's Young Investor Career Award. Dr. Walton earned his PhD in applied physics from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, after graduating summa cum laude with a bachelor's degree in physics from, and, and electrical engineering, excuse me from North Carolina State University, Go Wolfpack, that is also my alum. <laughs> so he completed his, the Stanford Executive Program at the Graduate School of Business in 2019. He serves on the board of the National Society of Black Physicists, the Research Advisory Board of the IBM HBCU Quantum Center, and the Corporate Affiliate Boards at the Universities of California in Santa Barbara and San Diego. Dr. Walton has authored and co-authored 22 US patents and more than 60 technical reports. So it is with great pleasure and great honor that I give the floor to our speaker today, Dr. Delnell Walter. Thank you very much for the gracious introduction, Elon. Great to see you. And like you said, go pack. All right, I'm going to share. I'm gonna tell a few stories today that I think you may find interesting. I'm gonna talk about Gorilla Glass, which I think most of you may have heard of by now, maybe even more so than Corny, it seems. Elon, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you great. And you can see my slide? Yep. All right, let's go. All right, so I'm gonna give a historical perspective of Gorilla Glass, but specifically, I'm gonna give a black historical perspective. Uh, in other words, y'all ain't even ready for what y'all about to hear. All right, so as Elon just graciously introduced, I'm Donnell Walton. And I'm gonna start with, uh, going back 60 years ago. 60 years ago in a, a small a county in North Carolina, a rural area in North Carolina, Louise Cartfield was going home from a, multiple shifts as a nurse. And uh, she, you know, whether she dozed off or whatever, she got into a, a horrible accident where she went through the windshield. Um, she was, Okay, she had to go to the hospital, but she she survived. But she, you know, the car was a mess. So that's kind of kind of a prelogue to the story. So I'll get into the story. So as Elon said, I started my career uh, at Howard as a young debonair optical physicist with not enough equipment. Obviously, uh, this is one of my first uh, selfies, and cameras were huge back then. So I, you know, my arm almost fell asleep trying to take this picture. And, uh, and this is when I was first starting to get my lab populated in, in, in Howard. And I was uh, happy and, and never thought I would ever leave Howard. But life happens. And I went to Howard, or I went from Howard to Corning, 
um, during the telecom boom of the early 2000s. And then after the telecom bubble burst, um, I used one of the skills that uh, developed at Howard, which I would have never thought I would have needed in the industry is grant writing. So we wrote a proposal to take our milliwatt, 10 to the minus third watt fiber, optical fiber amplifiers, all the way up to the kilowatt level for DARPA. And we were able to demonstrate uh, kilowatt uh, operations, uh, continuous wave kilowatt operation within 18 months. Um, we had some, some nice packaging, single mode. And what was very um, interesting about this was not only was it single spatial mode, it was single longitudinal mode, which is a huge challenge for high power because such and the various nonlinearities as stimulated brilliant scattering would redirect your light directly back at your pump and, and cause a catastrophic failure. But we were able to mitigate that um, and able to demonstrate this. And the cool thing about it was this was about 10, $15 million we got from DARPA. And DARPA was so interested in this work that they wanted us to continue. And they wanted to step up the funding by an order of magnitude. So I thought this is my come up. This is the work that I did in uh, a great, a direct uh, continuation of the work that I did as a graduate student, that lab that I started at Howard and being able to get another hundred million or so to continue it. And before we could actually sign off on it with DARPA, our management at Corning said, no, we don't wanna do this. We're not going any further. No, thank you for your money. And I, uh, <laughs> and that, that took the you know the wing uh, the the wind out of my sails. I didn't really understand at the time. I had all my little private theories, you know, they didn't like me because I was light skinned or or whatever it was. But it turned out that what I didn't have visibility to as a bench scientist was that as our work or coining or as the market of telecom was going down, the mark the industry of display uh, specifically liquid crystal displays was ramping up. So Corning was in the process of reinventing itself in another area, but I, did, I couldn't see that because we were focused uh, on optic, uh, directly on laser optics. And so, um, so we worked with a guy, Ming Jun Lee, a, a brilliant um, fiber designer. And he was the, the person with whom we worked and designed all these really cool, uh, they were waveguides for light, so you could propagate high powers of light, but to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, mitigate the nonlinearities, they were anti waveguides for the pho phonons that were created as all of that um, energy and heat was being deposited into the glass. So he was a really good guy to work with. I'll take a quick pause now and I'll tell you uh, one of the most important stories or lessons that I ever learned. It was uh, for my grandmother when I was single digit age. And my grandparents, like many uh, African-Americans migrated from the South to the North during the, you know, the early part of the last century. Um, that was, and that was brilliantly depicted by Isabel Wilkerson's first book, uh, Warmth of uh, Other Sons, but she kind of dropped the ball on her second book cast, but I digress. But, my, uh, so, but as they moved from the rural South to kind of the semi-rural North or the, the, the suburban uh, North, uh, my grandfather, who was a farmer, but then he worked in the auto industry, but he maintained some of the small animals. He had chickens and uh, specifically baby chicks, which I love to play with. And one day I, I, you know, I had one in my hands and it was dead. So I went to my grandmother and I said, Ma, don't, 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 don't judge me like Chris Rock. He said, if you call your mom, your grandmama, mama, and your mama family going to jail, I haven't gone to jail yet. But I said, Ma, you know, look. And my grandmother looked at the, the dead baby chick. She said, what happened? And I looked at her and with all my brilliant brain power, I said, it was like this. And she looked at me and she gave me the most important advice I've ever gotten in my life. She said, boy, she called me boy. She said, boy, always hang around people smarter than you. Cause I'm the smartest person in the room. That's not a good room to be in. So, and this is the advice that has lasted me a long, long time. So I mentioned we work with DARPA and then, and, and then we, what we did was, even though we didn't succeed uh, with, that, with, the, with that work, what we were able to do was take all the patents that we generated um, from that work and uh, leverage them. And, and we actually had some uh, product that was coming out called Clear Curve. And this was a, a fiber that would, could be handled 
it was, even though it was glass, it could be handled as, as ruggedly as, um, you know, copper cable. And it was for fiber to the home deployments. But New Friend was a company, it's been since been bought by Triumph Lasers, but it was a company that had some blocking uh, intellectual property, but they were still interested in pursuing fiber lasers. So we were able to do a horse trade between the, the, uh, the, the intellectual property uh, portfolio that we created for, for our fiber lasers to get their potentially blocking IP. So we were able to uh, effectively uh, launched this product to ClearCurve and you know made you know, quite a few bucks for the company. So it's just kind of an interesting way that I would have never thought that I thought that the project was great. Then I thought it was dead. Then it kind of came back again and, and, and was turned out to be quite lucrative for the company. So what, what happened here was there was a guy named, a brother named Norman Hairston. And this is where the Gorilla Glass story begins. Uh, our CEO uh, went to Norman, who used to work for Corning and was now kind of an investor slash, um, he, was, he was a Silicon Valley personality and Corning, the Corning Incorporated, where our work is headquartered in rural upstate New York. And uh, so he was in, and so our CEO knew Norm. He said, Norm, would you uh, help broker a meeting with Steve Jobs? I want to talk to him about some of the work we're doing and see if we can't get a partnership with him. So Norm was like, hey, no problem. He knew some folks at Apple. He brokered this meeting by our, at, at our CEO's behest. What our CEO wanted to talk to him about was Corning was working on green lasers and some of the work I, I, we were working on it tangentially because we had high power infrared sources. You generate you know, green lasers at the time before native green came along. You, know, you could actually grow um, semiconductors that could emit green uh, fairly efficiently um, was to, to be able to do um, a nonlinear conversion of, uh, of, of infrared light into, into the green and to make extremely small packages. So we were doing some work on this. Our CEO wanted to pose that to Steve Jobs because not, not even primarily because of his affiliation with Apple, because remember this is, this is 2006. So Apple was really known for being kind of a second, maybe even a third tier computer company. They had iPad, uh, iPods and um, you know, not, not, a, not a really major player you know, 15 years ago. But um, he was interested in proposing this technology to um, Steve because Steve was just stepping down as the uh, CEO of Pixar. So he really was interested in, in, in looking at this you know, uh, green uh, going together with uh, red and blue lasers to actually make laser projectors. So that was really the nature of this um, interaction that our CEO wanted. What ended up happening was, uh, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, they had the meeting, Steve Jobs was absolutely uninterested in green lasers and, and the other things that our, our CEO proposed to him. But he was impressed with the technical breadth and depth of Corning and what he saw. So what Steve did was he actually went into his pocket and pulled out a prototype of an, a phone. And he said, look, this is what we're working on now. This is gonna be big. Um, but at the time it had a plastic cover and whenever you put it in your pocket, um, it would be completely scratched up within a day or two. And this, you know, this high resolution, um, uh, beautiful, beautifully colored screen would be all scratched up and barely intelligible. He said, if you guys could actually give me a glass that could survive the vicissitudes of being in a, in a pocket, a jean pocket, a purse or whatever, that would be huge. And being visionaries, Corning came back and said, we're never going to do that. I mean, that's silly. What I mean, what does Apple know about making phones? Um, and uh, keep in mind at the time in 2006, and this slide isn't imp as impressive as it used to be, but every phone at the time was a flip phone. And not only was every phone at the time a flip phone, but every, time, every phone in the foreseeable future was a flip phone. For someone who's not even from a phone company to actually go in their pocket and show a phone without a keyboard on it, just an exposed piece of glass, a little slate, device was, was looked crazy. So we had no interest in pursuing this. The reason this is interesting now because Samsung is, is bringing flip back, baby, you know, but only not it with keyboards, but with one screen. But anyway, but at the time, everything was a flip Motorola. Everything was flip phone. So enter uh, James Hollis. So Hollis uh, is a, a good guy, business guy. He, I knew him because he was in the business or in a business unit for Corning, uh, basically in, in an internal venture capitalist. He was looking for small opportunities to kind of help grow Corning. 
and keep keep. But his whole thing was about getting getting putting money in in, in the board. And he was uh, one of my uh, uh, steering committee members of the fiber laser. So we got to know each other through that because he was really trying to make that a business. And when it kind of fell apart internally, you know, we, we still stayed in touch. So he heard about this kind of failed meeting at Apple. And he said, wait, we could actually make a strong glass. Wouldn't even cost as much because we had a small plant in Danville, Virginia. And we were already working on tough glass for watch cover for watches, like watch crystals, so-called crystals. And also we were making some for Motorola. So he said, yeah, we could probably do that. And so we made the connections with Apple. And for a few hundreds of thousands of dollars, we were able to produce the first uh, all the glass for the first iPhone. Um, so it was kind of a, a, you know, so it went that that first year was, you know, tens of millions of dollars, 10, maybe 20, 25, $30 million or so we made, you know, from a very, very small investment of, you know, depreciated uh, equipment. So then what we want to do, then, and then the iPhone was surprised, put surprise accordingly. So it was a, it was a, it was a uh, success. So they wanted more and more glass, but that small plant uh, in, in Virginia was out of capacity. So we needed to go to a larger plant that made bigger sheets of glass for display. And we said, hey, we would like to make this Gorilla Glass. And it was called Gorilla Glass because um, way back in the day, uh, there was a uh, American Tourister commercial uh, for, for luggage and they would show how tough the luggage was by doing a simulation a video simulation of uh, gorillas handling the bags as, as they, you know, simulating how they get processed <laughs> on the conveyors and the airports. So we, we saw it was something that could survive that kind of uh, gorilla handling. So we, uh, so Hollis went to, uh, went backwards, sorry. He went to Vaughn Hall, who's another brother who was the plant manager of our Danville plant and, uh, or not, sorry, not a Denver, our Harrodsburg plant, which was making display glass. And he said, hey, man, we have an opportunity. It's a growing opportunity. Let's do this. And almost everyone else is like, no, we're, we're trying to get at the time, you know, 30, 40, 50 inch LCD. We, we say you can make glass that size. That's how you make money, not these little baby, you know, five, three and a half, four inch screens. You can't. And plus, you'd have to have everybody in the world have one of these things or even two of them. Who, who, would, who, would, who would have predicted that would have been a reality in 15 years? So people were saying, no, we don't want to do this. But Vaughn was like, hey, you know, this is interesting. We do, and, and the other interesting part about it was Gorilla Glass, which we'll, talk, which we'll talk about a little bit later, it has in it um, sodium and some other alkali uh, elements that are forbidden in display. Um, so the glasses that were being made in this Harrisburg plant prided themselves on being alkali free because if you're putting silicon, you know, thin film transistors on something, the, the silicon would actually uh, poison it. So, they, so for us to say, hey, man, we want to make some glass in your clean plant. We want to pull, you know, basically pour salt everywhere. They're like, nah, no can do. But Vaughn, very creative. He said, hey, we do have uh, a, a, a manufacturing environment here. It's end of life anyway. You can, and you can, can you make, can you, can you use that? So uh, the team started making glass there. Hollis pulled me back into the thing. He said, hey, you're not doing anything anyway. Don't nobody want the stuff you're working on. Why don't you come work with us and kind of help uh, educate the industry on this Gorilla Glass stuff? You know, it's going to be big. And I was like, man, that's crazy. And I had the same reservations. I said, Apple doesn't know anything about making phones. Gorilla Glass sounds vaguely racist, possibly. And, you know, all, all these different reasons. But, you know, Hollis was uh, much more business uh, connected than I was. So he'd already gotten the CEO to drag me onto the, onto the team. So uh, it was... Uh, the team comprised uh, another gentleman and, and, and me um, to kind of work with all these different companies, Apple on more things than all these other companies to actually start to get them, Dell, HP, you name it, to try to get them to start designing our glass in, which was interesting because most, most designers were used to working with metals or pixel formed and magnesium, different things, all the laptop and foam into plastics. They weren't used to glass and glass has a very different failure mode. So we were, you know, we, we were learning quickly about how fracture mechanics and how brittle materials behave and teaching the industry, teaching engineers how to do that. And it was a success. I mean, so very, very early on, we went uh, from 2008, as I mentioned, uh, we were on just 
a few devices, Apple primarily, then, then Acer and Asus, uh, the Chinese brand started to come up. We were on maybe 33 brands, uh, almost a thousand models and over a billion devices worldwide by 2012. And then um, what, what was really cool and it was an amazing thing is that we went from, as I said, tens of millions of dollars in that first year of revenue to over a billion dollars in just four years, which was absolutely the fastest growing um, business in, in, in Corning's history. And it was uh, very cool to be a part of that. So I mentioned that there were only a few of us uh, that were working on it, but the cool thing about it was, I'll, I'll take a little brief aside here and talk about tough glass. What, what is, what's so special about uh, this glass? So we started working on, or Corning started working on tough glass 50 years ago. Um, or more than 50 years ago, actually, it was a called Project Muscle. Our, our, one of our uh, CTO or, or the, the guy in charge of research said, Armistead said, hey, you know, glass is great material, does a lot of cool things, but it breaks. Why don't you guys fix that? So we, uh, the, the earlier aspects of this we were looking at phone booths, looking at uh, fairings for military aircraft, helicopters, and also some car uh, windshields. That was the initial uh, applications. Who would have guessed that it would actually go in your pocket many, many years ago? So these were the initial applications of tough glass. So let's talk about what, what tough glass is. So to start with, since it's Saturday morning, let's show a Saturday morning cartoon. The fun, the fun part is why glass breaks in the first place. So glass needs two things. It needs a surface flaw and some stress on that flaw, and specifically a tensile stress. So if it's a chip or a cracker, it can be microscopic. And so Corning makes glass that has low flaw um, uh, density. So how we make glass. So we put all of our stuff into a vat <laughs> and you know, it's silica, silica. So it's very high to, to actually get this melted. And then what happens is it pours into a trough called an isopite where you fill the trough and then it's uh, designed to look at uh, the viscoelastic flow. So when it flows together at the apex of this, this is where the glass is made. So gravity, assist this glass. So it's made, it can be over 10 feet wide and, and uh, microns thick. So that's how you actually make the glass low flaws on uh, the surface roughness is on the order of angstroms because uh, nothing, nothing touches it. Then we have, you know, mecha our mechanical handling, laser or mechanical scribing down to the part size that you need. And to actually strengthen it, it's dipped into a molten bath of potassium nitrate and potassium ions are larger diameter than sodium. So the potassium goes in, kicks the sodium out. And because it takes up more volume, you have compression around all the exposed surfaces. You need tension. So you, can have, you have to actually overcome that compression to get the tension to actually break the glass. So that's actually the strength. So this ice cream sandwich is showing you the compressive layer. But because of Newton's third law, you have to have a tensile layer in the center. And you have to, as long as you stay away from that, your glass can can survive. And this is actually showing that. So if you ion exchange it, it gets the, 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 uh, the, the flaws under compression so it can't propagate where if it were an ion exchange, it would just shatter. And we'll show that a little later. So this is the glass on the phone. And we've since moved to like larger devices, tablets, iPods, uh, laptops, in cars, because cars are new, new mobile electronics, pun intended, and even light weighting of elevators. So it's kind of like a, a, a very quick cartoon, since we can't watch Scooby today, of how uh, the, the kind of the physics of making and strengthening glass. But, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of science to that even. So if I, if, like we have this little device here, so if we hit it, what it does is slowly generates a crack, and that crack goes down through the compressive layer into the tensile layer. And when it gets to the tensile layer, you will see how it breaks, right? So it actually spontaneously breaks. So this is this is actually, so what happened was I pecked it, I created a little crack, it, it propagated slowly through the compressive layer into the tensile layer. When it got to the tensile layer, spontaneously um, uh, propagated into a crack. So all you physicists and scientists, I, I, I'm gonna need your discerning eye here because this is just showing you how, um, you know, there is, there is a science to actually strengthening this. The, the amount of time and temperature and concentration, everything else of, of that bath that actually causes this to, to, to break this way. 
So I'm going to show you what could happen and what does happen if people try to um, chemically strengthen this to the wrong uh, time temperature compositional requirements. So you saw how it broke that time. So see if you can tell the difference between that break and the same kind of piece of glass, same composition of glass, but different ion exchange conditions. So the same pet. So see if you can tell the difference between how that one breaks and how this one breaks. So do I have to play it again? Did you guys catch the difference between the two breaks? So there, there is quite a bit of science, um, quite a bit of physics, chemistry, uh, material science into designing these glasses optimally and then processing them, uh, processing them afterwards. So, the, so what ended up happening was we, we uh, started learning a lot about this supply chain, which is an interesting word these days, um, so we're the glass manufacturer. We're providing glass. Not it, it would be easy if we could just provide it to Apple. But as you know, Apple, your, your Apple products say designed in Cupertino, made in China. And so there's all these different companies for a different, a particular one that can process your glass. People that actually finish it. People that I uh, ion exchange it, make it stronger, strengthen it. People that put uh, indium tin oxide on it to make the touch. Um, to make it touch worth to, to, to be able to receive the capacitive touch. Um, people actually build that into display panels, ODM. So these are all the different touch points for like one program. So our, our team, which I told you earlier was just two folks, had to grow to accommodate not just things that are happening, even though we're working with American uh, brands like Dell, um, uh, Apple, HP, all these things are being made all over. Asia throughout all these other uh, companies throughout the supply chain. So our team had to, oh yeah, our team had to become a lot more complex in order to deal with all the different uh, requirements at each of these different phases in each of these different geographic locations with all these different technologies. So what people need the glass to do to integrate into a display stack is different than what people need the glass to do in order to be compatible with a large scale um, uh, deposition of like indium tin oxide, for example. But one of the main tests of how good your uh, work is, is is the so-called frog test, which I'll show. And that's if you can put a, uh, an application on here and it can actually emulate something that can trick an actual frog. And this is something that a, a lot of our companies have to work with. And, you know, so it's, you have to get the right frog, the rock. And then what happens is a lot of times uh, the frog got to have the right temperament. And if they don't, okay, so that, 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 that's, not, that's not true at all. So the team grew for just a, from just a few of us to about two thirds of the folks that you see here um, are, were on the team. So we had about 35 uh, engineers and scientists that were geographically spread out among multiple um, locations, uh, Europe, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, China, India, uh, the United States, we only have a few of us here. <clears throat> and so th this, was, this is what the team grew to, grew to become. So this is one of our training sessions that was done in, uh, in Jiamen, uh, China, which is one of our um, works. And I, and, I, and I wanted to give a shout out to uh, the gentleman to my right here, Bo, who I think is here right today. Bo joined the team a little bit, and I, I'm not as sure, maybe as reluctantly as I did, and I don't think he really appreciated all of the good work that he did because it wasn't, you know, the kind of this hard, hardcore physics. I mean, he, he was able to knock the physics stuff out, but he he actually incubated a relationship with Microsoft um, as Microsoft was making surfaces with our glass, and he spent a lot of time in this in this in this facility, and that work led to hundreds of millions of dollars for the company and a very good relationship that we have with. The big Microsoft, which is currently, as of last week, the biggest company by market capitalization in the world for 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 Corning. So just it was really it was a, this was a very fun and a good time of 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 of, of, of the work to actually go all the way from learning new um, science to being able to go out and immediately get tested by deploying it 
and translating it directly to, uh, to revenue. Um, which brings me to the kinds of people that we were looking for at the time. You don't, don't worry about reading this. I'll give you the highlights. And the little cube that you, or the little um, uh, uh, rectang or rectangular solid that you see here is kind of, a, if you think about the white top of it, it's like a, uh, a subway map. And then, you, and then you go down into it, it's like burrowing. So what this is really showing is kind of the difference between being a specialist, and that's the people that go to a certain point and they just drip down, dig, dig down. And then sometimes even if you're a specialist, you end up maybe bifurcating or trifurcating into different areas. But, that's, but, but generalists are people that kind of go across in, in, in a plane here and look at different areas of expertise, be it, you know, and, and one of the cool things about industry, uh, a, a quick commercial is that I've been here for 22 years. And if you want to, you can do the equivalent of another advanced degree or PhD every three to five years. In a, in a completely different discipline, which, which, which I've done as I think back over my career. And, but the interesting thing is, I know you're in grad school or undergrad, you're like, yeah, who would wanna do that? The interesting thing is the teacher to student ratio is completely inverted. You are surrounded by these experts in these fields if you want to be humble and go out and learn and even be willing to teach what you know to them. So I've been able to learn a lot about brittle materials, fracture mechanics, uh, glass, glass science, um, most recently, um, cell biology, but that, you know that's that's not that's not the point of this story. But it, the the point is that there's a, there's a very good career to combine being a uh, some general being a generalist to also being a, uh, being a specialist. So what's next? As I kind of wrap this up, um, some of the work that was done, like I told you, we we tried to make the glass by having uh, very few flaws in the first place through through the. Uh, fabrication of the glass and strengthening the glass, what will be very cool is that you can intrinsically uh, make the glass itself, even before you strengthen it, have some damage resistance. So this has been a lot of work that has been done uh, with Corning to, uh, to have like glass as an elastic material can't store energy, but for different compositions and for different what are called uh, molar fractions, you can get localized plastic deformation, which would, um, reduce its uh, or increase its resistance, resistance to damage and re, um, so it's local densification and also it's uh, increases its resistance to scratches. <clears throat> so another big thing is you know we, we think about um, being outside with our devices more than inside with phones it's, it's pretty easy to get out of the sun but you know the, the sun is an extremely bright source so just a little four or eight percent reflection you have off you you can make your make your screens unreadable. So you can crank up the backlights, but then you, your, your battery doesn't last. So we've done a lot of very nice work, primarily in, in, a, in watches or, or, or wearables to uh, uh, incorporate anti-reflective um, capability onto the glass and with, with the added requirement that glass has to maintain its damage resistance and its scratch resistance in, in addition to uh, reducing the, the uh, uh, the um, reflectivity to below a percent. And this hole in the glass that you see here is not a hole in the glass. It's actually just showing that 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 a patterned area is where the, the anti-reflection is there. So you can actually see how effective this can be. And well, uh, as we met, uh, as I alluded to much earlier, we talked about how glass is becoming, uh, we're making it thinner and, and trying to maintain its strength as the new form factors go back to being foldable, the difference being instead of a keyboard on one side and a screen on the other side, it's just one big screen and the entire screen is foldable, but it still has to be protected and scratch resistant. So we're looking at glasses that, um, that, can, that can sustain that and fold. And you're starting to see those on the market now with, with the new Samsung devices. And I'll conclude with a few thoughts about history. The first one is, uh, 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 a story that 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 from 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 my undergrad, uh, my sec first or second year, you know, so I went to NC State as I mentioned, and there's a big rivalry. Well, at least NC State thinks it's a big rivalry between us and uh, Carolina, and there was a game uh, that I attended where Carolina was ranked number one at the time in, in the country, and State beat them by one or two points, and it was just an amazing game, right? And then the the, the uh, NC State paper had an article about 
how great the team really is and people didn't really appreciate them. You know, we were overshadowed by Carolina, but we showed everyone how much greater we were and on and on and how, you know, the score really didn't reflect how badly we really beat them. And I was like, yeah, you know, rah, rah, go pack. That's right. And I was uh, seeing someone at the time who was at Carolina and I was visiting Chapel Hill and I just happened to pick up one of their newspapers and they had a completely different rendition of what happened at that game. They said that, you know, mistakes cost them the game. Our, you know, we beat ourselves. And I was like, man, what game did they watch, right? I mean, you know, obviously state could have beaten them worse. And they were in, the, the, the important part of this story is that there was no malice intended on either side. I don't, I don't want to sound like, a, <laughs> like Trump. Oh, Nazis are they're good people on both sides. But the point here is that a lot of times we construe things as being, you know, biased against us when actually they're really biased for themselves. It's biased nonetheless, but it's not, it, there's no animosity involved. So the point here is that this is very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to capture history uh, while you're in the throes of it. I mean, we get spoiled by reading books and watching movies where they kind of foreshadow things, but the author, is not really living that in, in real time, right? The author already has the ending in mind. He already knows what uh, Harry Potter's birthmark meant or whatever, or he already knows how in uh, uh, The Heart of They Fall that, oh no, I'm not gonna spoil that in case you haven't seen it yet. You should take some time out to see it though. It's actually very entertaining. Um, so the, the point here is that, you know, we, we, wanna, we wanna take some time out. We think things may be antagonistic against us, but the, the, the story is continues to unfold. And an example of that is I mentioned when we first started, uh, and, and like I said, it's hard for you to make sense, a real sense of what happened. We have these stories and we think we know, but we, we don't know the whole story. I, I gave you an example of when my project was killed, even in spite of we turned down $100 million. I didn't know that the, the macroeconomics of the company, I, I just didn't have visibility to that. So I, I took things personally. I was on the verge of leaving the company you know, all these different things, but it, it really had nothing to do with that. And, and I went on to do, you know, even better things. So you, it's hard to really know, you know, uh, what, what's happening while it's happening. And I, and I told you this example of how this glass was started 50 years ago. And one of the applications of it was uh, windshields. But, for, and we, but fortunately we went to the car companies and we said, hey, we have a way to make indestructible windshields. And they told us, that we don't want indestructible windshields. We want safety windshields. We want people to go through uh, windshields, not splatter on them. And, and I told you that, 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 that preliminary example about the, the, the nurse going home from work and going through the windshield, that was Hollis's mom before, you know, five years before he was born. So had we had succeeded in our earlier incarnation of Gorilla Glass for windshields, you know, it's a time loop, Star Trek people. Hollis would have never existed in order to make Gorilla Glass successful in the future. So, so just, just, just an interesting thing. And he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have partnered with me to take this horribly racist picture that, <laughs> that somebody actually waited for that screen to come with Gorilla for this. This was in a magazine, I think a Rolling Stone magazine years ago. So it's really our duty as scientists, as, as, as humans to, to really look for the broadest possible interpretations of, of, of events, because again, it's really hard to know. It's, and this is why I close with uh, one of my absolute favorite quotes, uh, Ken Manning, professor at uh, MIT. He wrote this article in uh, MIT Tech Review, and it said that on the surface, a ray of light exhibits uniform makeup, but when viewed through a prism, light scatters into the many colors of the rainbow. Under the prism of analysis, the scientific community similarly reveals its heterogeneity. So, you know, you, you, you know all those, uh, you know, black folks and, and uh, sisters were uh, working on uh, Gorilla Glass in the background, you know, but it, but it, but it happened. So there's more things to meet the eye. So thank you very much. And oh, most importantly, we are definitely hiring all locations. Uh, good, 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 good hard science folks. And there are, there are jobs I think posted on the website and I'm going to be in the booth in exhibit hall three after this talk. So I will end here for now. And I definitely appreciate your time and attention. Oh, that's what the rest of my shirt says. Someone in the chat asked me that. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Donnell. Uh, so in case y'all missed Elon, unfortunately, she won't be handling Q&A. It's going to be me, uh, Nico, another member of the NSBP Student Council. So uh, I'm going to uh, I want to encourage everybody to put your questions in the Q&A, but we also have uh, uh, a couple of questions that I saw in the chat. But I'm going to start out with the one question we have in the Q&A, uh, which is, can you talk a little bit more? Uh, can you talk about a bit about the difference between life in industry, academia, and national labs? Um, was that question for me, Nico, or was it for you? <laughs> <laughs> Probably um, have more experience with that than I do. Oh, well, yeah. That, 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 that keep, so yeah, so I, when I went to Howard, just to kind of give you a, a, a level set, when I went to Howard, um, I was working on at the, uh, the early stages of the advanced photon source at, uh, at Argonne. So I've had some, uh, some fun times at, um, at, at uh, National Labs, academia, and, and industry. And what I will say about that is I know that people like to say different things or this is this, this is this. The, the boundaries are a little more nebulous. Like, like, like I mentioned, I would have never guessed that one of the most important things that I learned working at a national lab and a, a university that would actually translate to industry was my ability to write grants. You, you just don't expect that to be a thing. And the other thing is I've, you know, I taught several years at Powers. I was there for three and a half years. I've done a lot more teaching since I've been in industry, right? I, I mentioned that the main thing, a main job is, although the differences between pedagogy and andragogy, pedagogy is, you know, the, the it basically we, we use it, we can, we, we use it as a, the education of people, but peda, peda means child, where andra means adult. So adult learning is something that you get an opportunity to do if you so choose in industry. So my long-winded answer to that, uh, if I had to make it abridged, is that I would say um, there are opportunities for you to pursue what kinds of things you want to pursue in all three of those environments, quite frankly. And there are headaches in all three of those environments, but they're not, in, they're not necessarily intuitive. Definitely dig in and ask people, just like you're asking me, um, what they like and dislike about the question so you can make an informed decision. Thank you for the question and thanks, Nikki. All right, thank you so much. Again, I want to encourage everybody to put any questions you have in the Q and A, but we also have, uh, so we had one question uh, in the chat that I was also curious about. Uh, have you worked with uh, the screens of reading tablets? They have very good anti-reflective systems. Yeah, so you mean like a, a electrophoretic, like a Kindle or mm. uh, ink? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a, a lot of those were plastic. Um, as a matter of fact, the new uh, Remarkable has a, Gorilla Glass on it, and it's uh, not necessarily anti-reflective, but it's so-called anti-glare, which is different. So reflectivity doesn't go down; it just goes in different directions. So that means the glass is textured. And but the answer is yes. We we've been working. Well, that, that was a huge. I mean, the volumes of those are lower, but we definitely are are, are on many 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 uh, e ink uh, electrophoretic, and and also some there are some watches that have e ink that we work on as well. So thanks again. Thanks for the question. All right, and our next question that we have in the Q&A is, uh, does industry consider PhD and postdoc as experience? Yes. So industry, I, I, so I would say today that um, I'm really re, uh, representing industrial research, right? So there are industrial positions that have no research component to them whatsoever, right? So they may have a different uh, way that they interpret that, but, but industrial research labs, we publish papers, we chair sessions at conferences, we give plenary talks on a Saturday morning. You know, we, we, we behave in, in the same way that our counterparts in industry, I mean, in academia and national labs behave. So absolutely, we, uh, you know, uh, like if you're gonna work in a plant, say for example, and not in research, you know, you're looking more at bachelor's, master's, even, or even, you know, maybe even an associate's degree. But if you're gonna work in a lab as an, you know, as an individual contributor or, or a principal investigator, you know, PhDs, masters are definitely what you're, what you're looking for. All right, and our next question that I see in the chat is uh, from Stefan. I have a question. Are there advantages of being a physicist in industry to mentor PhD students? If so, what would that look like? And Stefan can't unmute himself, can I? I would like to know more 
exactly yeah. what you mean. Uh, I'm unmuted now, Donald. Great, this is great talk, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, okay, I guess I just I'm, I don't want to hear your voice. Meet yourself again. No, go ahead, Stefan. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess the question, the question really is pointed at, you know, there, um, you know, you're a PhD physicist and, you know, you went through academia, all that stuff, but then you gain these superpowers of knowing how to translate all that physics into, you know, <laughs> product and all that stuff. And I think that there are some real advantages, like, and if there were room or like in your, you know, in sort of in industry in particular yours, where room is given for you to like, you know, to, um, add some extra training to a PhD student, what would that look like? And if those opportunities do exist on your end of yeah, things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so absolutely. So I, I, I was, uh, I've done some things for the far west region of APS, as far as uh, what's, what we call, or what I call uh, kind of lab to market and some of the things that we've learned. But yeah, I, 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 um, we, 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 I, we definitely do that a lot. I would love the opportunity to talk with you more about how to, do it for uh, melanated populations more so. But yeah, we, we definitely did. As a matter of fact, I was working with um, the recent doctor from Dayton on, uh, on for, for the last student event, which, which got COVIDized on uh, bringing in some things about entrepreneurship and technical entrepreneurship. And I was bringing in a, a friend of mine who uh, runs an incubator, but I think that just basically got, we'll have to get that back on track. Um, but yeah, yeah no, that absolutely. Was, that was a subtle question because NSBP has plans for you in that way. Like, and, and the other thing to add to that is that, um, like certain universities, like mine, we have this thing called um, professors of the, of the of the practice, where you you come and do a year, and you actually you are the professor of the, of the practice, and we, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's. And I'll say one more thing, Stefan. One one of my pet projects that I'd like to carve out some time to do is. You know, Corning is one of the research labs. So Corning was founded back in 1851. So we're 170 years old. Our research labs were started 100 years ago. And there are only five companies that have research labs that are over 100 years old. So we've been doing research for a long time. We've been translating things from the lab to products for a long time. One of my side projects right now is to try to understand why our lab consider, continues where like Bell Labs, for example, is now Nokia, right? I mean, the, and that was that was a lab I wanted to go to when I came out of grad school. That's my first research experience was at Bell Labs, but we've persisted and they haven't. So I'm actually trying to codify that knowledge and, and what is it that's different, better, worse, whatever. So so I, I yeah yeah get me a, a, a pra practitioner a professorship at Brown, man. Well, I'll pick out a really nice let's, book. Let's seriously talk about that, by the way. I thought we were, whoa, I thought we were seriously talking, Nico, what, what were we just seriously talking? No, absolutely. I'd love to, Stefan. All right. And let me see. We got a lot of questions now. So the next question uh, in the Q&A is, uh, the evolution of glass is quite interesting. Is it possible for the glass to evolve into a self-healing material? Glass itself is tough because of the nature of glass. Glass is a brittle material, but there are glass composites and doing nanostructuring of glass that we're trying to work on just those things. It may be all inorganic glass or it may be a glass polymer hybrid, but yes, that is something that's very cool. Keep in mind that yes, I'm a scientist. Yes, I love physics but I got to pay the bill. So I don't want unbreakable glass, right? Because you only buy one of those. I want glass to break. I want it to be hard to break, but I want it to break. But absolutely, the, the physics and, and uh, nanoengineering of self-healing systems is something that's an extremely important um, area. Thank, and again, thank you for that question. All right, next question Here's is, is Corning doing anything with quantum information? What is the next frontier? Absolutely, uh, quantum information. Yeah, I mean, so we started, uh, Dr. Ratcliffe, on uh, you know developing low loss material, low loss fibers, and we did some papers with uh, um, I want to say Geneva, and uh, they're 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 out there. I think uh, uh, Dan Nolan is one of the and the and the guy I showed earlier, Ming Jun Lee. You can find those papers, and now we're doing work on you know uh, quantum memory. <clears throat> and some very diff many, many different components, uh, working with uh, silicon photonics and a lot of different startups and other companies. So yes, quantum is a big deal for us as far as computing and um, 
communications, quantum, everything from quantum key distribution all the way. And right now we have uh, several engagements with, with, uh, with INQ and multiple other uh, quantum computing companies too. So, and we're very interested in it from a materials informatics aspect, right? Doing quantum quantum machine learning to accelerate, like going tying it back to the, the prior question. We have a huge effort on using uh, physics informed machine learning algorithms to uh, come up with new materials. So the quantum, these materials are quantum. So we, we're definitely looking at quantum algorithms. Yes, is the answer. And the next frontier is uh, how do you accelerate the uh, discovery of new materials? Um, we're in Silicon Valley here. So people want to work at uh, software slash metaverse speeds. You know, you show them some new material today and then you see them next week. They say, what do you have since last week? So you don't, you don't develop materials that quickly. But, you know, so we have to do look at um, quantum computing, machine learning, everything else to be able to bring the bear to, to inform our uh, materials, materials discovery. So that's, that's the next frontier in that area. And the other frontier in a more macro area is sustainability. How can we make materials that satisfy our requirements and specifications, but they're recyclable? That, that's, a, that's, a huge, that's a huge interest of mine. All right, so the next question we got is, how did you leverage your work with these companies into patents? <gasps> Was that a dog or an Omega? <laughs> oh, you know who it was. <laughs> we'll be on later. Uh, yeah, um, so, so we have, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure. I, I, so all, all of the work that we, whenever we make something, it has to be patented. Um, so Corning has a huge patent law office. I, 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 I don't know. Asu is, that, Asu, is that what you're asking? I mean, how do you? We, 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 make, we write patents. I mean, Corning has about 11,600 active patents currently. So everything we do has to be patent protected. I, I think that's your question. Work to, I, I don't, sorry, work to ownership. Like, like, like Corning owns the patents, if that's what you're asking. You know, I, I, get, I get a salary and, and, and uh, those things or if I want to if I have something I think is so cool I can I can try to spin it off out of pouring and license it but but I, I I don't think I'm not sure if I'm catching your question okay so Asu says I see so that's good all right so hopefully that answered that but maybe we can uh uh we can potentially have a discussion. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be, that. I'll be at again. Yeah, come by the booth, man. We can chat more. Um, I'll, I'll literally be at the booth for the next. I don't know what my 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 my, my sentence is. It's at least an hour. So, I still come by. I'll, I'll look for you at the booth. All right. So our next question uh, is: When did you realize you wanted to pursue physics in school? Hmm. So there are two answers to that. When I, the first answer is, when did I realize it? And the question was, when did I realize I realized it? Um, I went to school as an electrical engineer and I liked physics. And one of the first professors that actually showed an interest in me was my physics professor. Said, hey, would you consider majoring in physics? And I looked up salaries and I was like, nah, I'm not doing that. He said, well, you can double major. So I double majored. But then when I go back into some, old, some notes and stuff I had from my third or fourth grade, I saw that you know when people asked me what I'd be, somehow I said nuclear physicist. I'm not sure what TV show or cartoon that I saw, but apparently all my life I wanted to be a physicist. But um, it, it actually manifested itself in undergrad by one one professor, who turned out um, was a very interesting guy. Uh, but 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 somebody showed interest in me, and I I really liked how physics went together and gave you more of a foundational understanding of engineering. But I've always liked kind of the balance in the both understanding how to make things work and making things work that people want. Very good, all right. Uh, so our next question is, was it difficult to get your patents granted? <sighs> um, difficult. Um, I, I'm going to defer that question to Jamie Valentine Miller, who does that for a living. I mean, I mean some patents are, no, I mean, the, the hard part is not the granted part. The hard part is coming up with, you know, patentable or, uh, you know, non-obvious ideas. But, you know, we have, we have a team of lawyers. I mean, I don't know, dozens, maybe 
scores of lawyers here that, that, that work either internally or they, they get people out. So the hard part is coming up with good, good things and good ideas. And, and that's the, that's the thing, Cor Corning, it cranks out inventions and part of that invention engine is patents, so. So in addition to writing external papers and internal papers, we write what are called invention disclosures where we come up with our ideas and then those get translated working with lawyers into, uh, into the patent. And they get examined by, I figured it was you, Jamie, and it gets examined by the meticulous eyes of Dr. Miller. All right, so our next question is, uh, why did the car companies not want non-breakable glass? What is the kind of glass they need to go through that's the safest? Right, so they, they so putting a glass that's unbreakable is like basically having a steel wall in front of you. So if you get out, if you hit it, you gone. You know, you're gonna be like a fillet, all broken bones. So what you really want is glass that will slow you down, right? So it's like, so what, what, you, what windshields are today are you know shatter resistant glass, uh, polymer layer to basically keep the glass from shattering too far and to, 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 to decelerate you as opposed to stopping you instantaneously, right? So you can have the, so say it's so-called safety glass. So it's a, it's a, it's a layer, a, a layered structure. We got a lot of, we got a lot of patent questions again. Uh, so yeah, back to the patent question. Does Corning file the patent in your name, although it is owned by them? Correct. Yeah. If you go to Google Patents or whatever your patents are, you'll find my name on things. But but uh, as the assignee. But but yeah, definitely. I was on the I was on the Corning plantation. But the good news is that for every patent we get, we get a bright shiny certificate with a two dollar bill attached to it. <laughs> two dollars and that's because uh thomas jefferson is on the two dollar bill and among all the things he's famous for <laughs> one of them is that he started the patent office mm. all right and our, our final question uh is how has your engineering degree helped your industrial efforts do you imagine you would have you do you imagine you would have been able to get as far with just the physics degree uh, yeah, that's, and, and there's another question in the chat I want to answer too from Paul. Uh, I want to address. Um, uh, the answer is yes. I mean, so it turns out that foundations are what you need. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier, if you're in industry and, it, as you, and if you want to, you can get degrees in a lot of things. And physics gives you an opportunity to, like right now, I'm 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 coming up to speed pretty quickly on uh, iRNA and some of the uh, some of the the uh, date, uh, drug discovery work that we're doing. Um, it's different, but but you know you know you have the confidence and you have the and, and the fundamentals to, to to do first principles and figure stuff out. So yeah, engineering is great because it gives you another perspective from which to think. That's what was helpful for me. I could look at problems from multiple angles early on, but ultimately that's what you want to do anyway. Is as many as many um the, the last thing I'll say is you know people have this expression they uh, this old thing says that life is not a sprint it's a marathon. I, I would say life is not a sprint it's a decathlon. And as many different, sometimes you have to run, sometimes you have to jump, sometimes you have to put a shot, throw a javelin, high jump. So anything, any of these skills that you can bring to bear on a problem, uh, the problems don't care about this disciplines, right? They, so yeah. So long story short, physics is just a starting point for you to, to learn and to bring to bear other things, if, if you want, if you want to. Or you can just go really, 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 really deep in, in physics if you want. Uh, Paul asked a question about um, Corning's involvement with uh, uh, HBCUs and MSIs, uh, like a lot of other companies, right, in the wake of uh, George Floyd's murder, Corning really tried to get on the ball. And one of the most visible things that we do is we just infuse several million dollars into a North Carolina A&T um, for business and uh, engineering students. And we have a long uh, standing relationship with FAM um, and, and their uh, College of Science and Technology. And uh, more uh, the AU Center, we do a lot of, so absolutely, absolutely um, uh, Paul, well, that's, that's super important. And we, um, a, lot of, a lot of us are alums of uh, HBCUs, so we, everything from Jackson State to um, almost every school with a accredited, um, ABET accredited engineering program, every HBCU Coring is uh, involved in, when we definitely hire 
um, lots of students from there as well for permanent and for internships. Even Morgan. All right, and finally, we're, we got, uh, well, we'll make sure we'll note, uh, uh, hopefully you saw this to Hattie, send a note saying uh, to please uh, call Hattie Carwell. Um, call Hattie but, Carwell? Yeah. <laughs> Again, was that to you, Nico, or was that to me? <laughs> Who you wanted to call you, Hattie? The one with the hair or the one with no hair? <laughs> And uh, uh, unless we have uh, any questions right after him, before I pass it off to him, uh, we got a question from Dr. Rock. In reference to your transition from academia to industry, can you share what major parameters you wrestled with to come to your decision to leave academia? <laughs> that was easy. Um, I had no desire whatsoever to leave academia. Um, you know, my, Willie, you know the answer. So, so my wife was doing a postdoc at NIST. And her postdoc was up. So being a brilliant strategist that I am, I said, look, I've been working with Corning all this time. Plus, we had gotten offers from Corning when we first finished our PhDs years before. And we were like, man, I don't know what would have to happen in my life for me to end up in a little podunk town like that. So fast forward to her ending her postdoc. I said, I got an idea. Let's go back. Why don't you go back to Corning, interview, get a job, hit your uh, postdoc advisor in the forehead like you uh you cutting, cutting, his, cutting him with some spades. Y'all don't, y'all don't do it anymore, do you? And say, boom, I got this job. What you gonna do? So she said, you sure? I said, I'm positive. So she did that. Got a job offer from Corning. Showed it to her advisor, and he said, yo, congratulations. We're gonna miss you. So it was a, it was a, uh, a, a, a two body problem, or two body problem slash four body problem. When we also had two, two, two kids, so it was hard for me to continue to work 18 hour days. That's necessary to get a lab going at Howard. I went to Corning and only worked 15 hour days. All right, thank you very much. Uh, unless we have any more questions because we've still got a little bit of time. Uh, yes, may I, ask, may I ask a question? <sighs> what you want? Um, and, and Dr. Walton, could you, <laughs> excuse me, could you um, share with us some of your, um, let me get a more better lighting. Could you share with us some, 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 oh, some what's of your up, pers Willie? personal side of you? Um, yeah, give us a feel, you know, you're a very technical kind of guy and things of that nature, but what do you do, you know, to let your hair down? I mean, or oh, you don't have any hair to, oh. to, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, what are your some of your hobbies and things that really you know take your mind off of things and stuff like that that you like to do? Just give us a, give us give us the personal side of, of Donnell Walton, if you wouldn't mind. Um, yeah, sure. Well, first I mean, of you're all, you're in fraternity. You know, I'm an uh, introvert. You know, things like that, all, all that kind of stuff. You know, just just trying to you know, my fraternal you know, affiliation. Get to know you on a on more of a personal note. Yeah. Um. Sure. So I, uh, one of the things I, so yeah, so uh, Dr. Rockward and I, we share uh, a fraternal affiliation. We're both members of Omega Psi Phi fraternity. And we also share uh, birthday weeks. So I think you have a birthday, so happy birthday, Willie. Um, now that my kids are grown-ish, um, the last 20 years spent with trying to uh, get them out of the house and move so they couldn't find me in case they need to come back. So I did that. But uh, the main thing I do, I think, is I, I cycle. I mean, I live about, well, I live now, I live about 35 miles from work. So I, tr I, I take the train halfway and I bike the other half. So I, I definitely ride my bike uh, every day. And I, I still really like science. I, I, I like learning about science and I'm working really, really hard to figure out how to uh, translate, you know, good ideas into, uh, into good products and, and not just for coring. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to figure out, is there a way to do that? So I spend a lot of time now um, working with startups and venture capital um, to, to, to just basically try to, to understand that more. And to Stefan's earlier point, to figure out how to, I mean, my, my, my time is coming to an end. So I'm really trying to figure out how do I pass that on to the next generation. So interests are working out um, and, and continuing to learn. 
How much you bench pressing now? What's that? Bench press? I don't. I stop, I don't work. I don't lift weights anymore. I just I do body weight exercises because I got plenty of body weight to exercise. With. Willie's asking that question because I traumatized him when we met. We used to have to work out together, and he call in sick every day. I don't know why you would uh why you would start this, Willie. Nico, he didn't want to work out with me, man. Well, I asked him why. Ask him. Why not? I'd do it. Come on. <laughs> All right, Dr. Rock, if unless we want to uh, wait a little bit for questions, we can pass it off to you, whatever you'd like to do. Yeah, why don't we pass it off? Like I said, if, if anyone does have any burning questions, I'll be chatting at the booth. So come on through. And I'll... Uh, but thanks again for your uh, attention and interest today. I, I enjoyed um, prepping for this and, uh, and the interaction. So thank you. Thank you all very much. And I love this organization. Um, thank you, Donnell. Um, so yeah, I'm supposed to come on and say some closing remarks. Um, but before um, we close off, I just want to actually um, say some, some um, make some remarks. First of all, this was one of the best talks I've actually ever heard. And I'm not just saying that because um, Donnell could bench press more than me. Um, <laughs> now, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I would like to say, though, is that one, I was just, Donnell's talk and his history just reminded me of something that I think is really unique about NSBP ever since I, you know, I was a young student and it's that spirit of benevolence. And I think that one of the things that on top of all his accomplishments, Donnell's accomplishments, um, you know, he really, he really exemplifies that spirit of benevolence. He's given so much of his service, his time, and actually, you know, really carrying NSBP through its tough times financially. He was the one that really took the lead in industry to really, you know, um, get us the necessary support. Um, and we, you know, we're ever grateful for that, that spirit of how you teach us that spirit of benevolence, you know, and it's kind of interesting, Donnell's birthday is two days from now. And I heard that he and Willie were born, you know, one, one day apart. And I wonder if that's any correlation to the fact that both of y'all don't have dreads. Um, <laughs> so so, so um, on that, on that happy note, I want to just say one more thing. And it actually has to do with something that inspired me. Um, you know, Donnell's um, PhD advisor was a great physicist, um, Herbert Winfell at the University of Michigan. And I actually have one last question to leave with Donnell, which is, you know, just a, our tradition of black excellence. You know, we look at the mentorship that happened through our jazz music with Miles and Coltrane. And I'm just saying like, you know, your advisor, how, what impact did that have in the fact that he was also a tremendous, you know, black physicist, black experimentalist? What did that mean to you? And how important was that tradition? So, Stefan, that's a, that's a, that's a, I didn't know, I didn't know y'all was going to go deep on me like this. First of all, let me, uh, I can't, let me see if I can show this. Can you see this picture? This is picture was taken yesterday. I was in, I was in Michigan. I gave a talk in Michigan. That's her. Can you see it? I can see it. Yep. Can see it. Yeah. So he, he has dread. So he, he makes up for uh, Willie and I being bald heads. But um, the funny thing about that, Stefan, is uh, I, I teased him. He gave me one of the most touching introductions I ever had. Almost my eyes teared up um, because he meant so he meant so much to me intellectually, as you said, emotionally. He's he's a theorist, by the way. I I, I learned my theory stuff from him, and uh, I did my experiments with uh, Gerard Maru. But uh, the funny part was that um, when uh, I was in grad school doing experiments. I called him at his house when I got some result. And I said, Herb, look, this is, look, I get this and this. He said, that's interesting. Listen to this. And he was just playing, he was just taking piano lessons at the time. He'd play his scales for me, right? And now he's like writing stuff. And it's just, he's amazing. So my biggest motivation in life is the fact that I'll never be like him. Because <laughs> I'm way older now than he was when we met. And I still haven't done what he's done. So and that kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier, and, and Stefan, I appreciate this, effort, is how things are just so, uh, so much more complex than, than tracking what number you are in the, in the PhD order, 
And it's not, it's never about, about just us as individuals. It's all, always about how much he's done for me, how much I'd love to, to do for the next folks and how much those next folks, we, we always wanna open door for people who open doors for people. And, and Herb, you know, helped me to, to learn that and, and try my best to teach it. Well, on that note, on that very special note, um, an honor to your PhD advisor. And thank you so much, Donnell. And um, we'll be we connecting uh, all of us later on. All right. We we, we again we um we we're very uh, excited. Uh, great great talk. Saturday morning, you know, Saturday morning live. Uh, NSBP, uh, we have had a wonderful talk uh, from a good friend and colleague, uh, lifelong friend. And that's, that's a be one of the beauties as, as our, our president, uh, Safan, has shared with us. That's one of the also great beauties of NSVP. We, we not only mentor or even be, or we appear mentors, we, we become lifelong friends and, um, and family uh, over, the, over the length of our careers. And again, we're ever so grateful for uh, a great friend of mine, uh, Donnell Walton, um, birthday, almost birth, well, we birthday brothers, one day apart is not too bad. Um, and um, I'll share with you some other details about, you know, him, you know, talking about the bench press uh -oh. thing, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. No, but, but um, with, the, with, with the conference, uh, we're in our third day, going strong. And now we just want to remind you of a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, first and foremost, we want to remind our members, please vote, vote. I found out that I think today is the last day to get your votes in. So uh, voting online, we have the voting online. So all eligible members, please, please, please go ahead and cast your vote uh, for the officers that would, would be elected uh, to represent us over the next, over the next uh, couple of years. And then, and then we um, looking at our schedule. Uh, after this, immediately we have we have um, the break. We have the break um, coming up. Uh, and thank you. I'm being assisted by my our wonderful student council uh, representative uh, Farah uh, Simpson. And um, um, I'm seeing a question on how do I. Oh, yeah. um, so again, the BNL, the B, uh, Brookhaven National Labs uh, site tour is, is an online virtual tour. We ask that you would please during this um, during the break. Uh, you know, take a look at it. Uh, also, going to the exhibit halls. Uh, exhibit halls will be cranking up. You know, at twelve thirty. Ask that you please go and um, and then go and visit all the exhibitors and the various opportunities they have. Some of the some of the exhibitors are even are are, are uh, um, especially for our students are giving them opportunities to actually um, uh, interview for summer internships even right now on the spot. Uh, so, you know, you can solidify your summer intern, uh, intern opportunity even right now. Uh, so we encourage you to go, go to the exhibitors, uh, see them all, graduate opportunities, graduate school opportunities too. So please, um, and oh, even, some of, even some of the exhibitors offering uh, positions, uh, employment positions for those who are getting ready to graduate. So you, you don't miss out on these uh, great opportunities. Uh, get ready to post a walkthrough for Gathertown. And then likewise, we go, likewise around one o'clock, we're going into our um, technical talks. And also some, uh, you know, Saturday is also a blend of technical talks and professional development. Our, a lot of our professional development um, sessions are going on. You, um, the student council, student, the student members, uh, there's a student member meeting uh, with all the student councils at one o'clock uh, in uh, on Gathertown. They're going to gather, Go, go and meet on Gather Town. So please, I want to remind all of our student members to please um, be at that student council meeting uh, at one o'clock on Gather Town. Um, the other sessions are moving through in physics, uh, as you'll see, women in physics, astro, um, advanced light sources, um, uh, CGR, and also CMP. Um, the, all of those uh, are still having some some of the talks. Uh, so please, if you will, uh, let us make sure we uh, attend and populate as 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 necessary. Then then after that, at two thirty, two thirty, we're going to have a um, very special um, virtual luncheon. 
a virtual lunch, and we really would count that you all would have already had your lunch by then. But um, our speaker would be our student representative, uh, president to the uh, student representative to the uh, executive board, uh, Ms. Farah Simpson. Um, looking forward to hearing from from her perspective. Um, she is moving along very well in her graduate doctoral program at Brown, but she would give us some great remarks. I, I promise you, you, you don't want to miss it. It's a treat. Um, so let's continue going on through our, our conference. Looking forward to, you know, just having a greater time. Some of these professional development sessions, many of them are coming up. I, um, we just hope that everyone would be there. Uh, and 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 also fill out the evaluations. We are also asking you to do the evaluations. We um, want to make sure that we gather, you know, a, a, a great sense of uh, the data that's associated with this virtual conference, uh, the second year of this virtual con conference. And so we need everyone. We need all of you all. Please go to the um, evaluation sessions um, uh, wherever you see. Um, um, uh, D. Cole, D as in dog, Cole, Darnell Cole, Dr. Darnell Cole, and the University of Southern California evaluation team. They're doing our evaluation for the conference, and we want to make sure we compare this data uh, with last year's data and, of course, the previous years uh, to give a greater ind indication of how things are going with the virtual conference uh, as we move forward. Again, uh, please, the evaluations, we ask that you would please uh, stop by the evaluation um, sessions and give your input. Um, and last but not least, uh, we are signing out, we'll be signing out shortly. Uh, and remember that, um, you know, we're preparing for next year. Next year will be our next year conference, 2022. Uh, we're preparing for it to be in person in person, but we want to have a great 2021 conference while we're moving along. And we ask that you all please participate uh, as we um, as we have seen such as great presentation today. And now I'll turn it back over to our moderator, uh, Ms. Elon Price. Okay, hello everybody. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Walton, for a very entertaining talk and a very interesting talk. Um, it, it was very helpful, I'm sure, to a lot of people uh, wondering about uh, industry and physics. So we're gonna go ahead and close this session for today. Uh, please go enjoy the rest of the conference and I'll see you in about 30 minutes at the, hopefully at the student member meeting. All right. Goodbye, everyone.